It would be nice. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. Uh, this evening we have uh, LED streetlights on the agenda, uh, budgeting, and we have a non-public session at the end of the meeting before old and after old and new business. Uh, any two ones? quick things? Um, one. Just um, as we're going into tomorrow, uh, celebrating Veterans Day, we want to thank all the uh, folks in Whipswich, past and present, who have served in the military. We thank them for the freedoms they have given us. Um, we hope that uh, you're able to take some time tomorrow, relax, and um, enjoy those same freedoms with your family and loved ones. Secondly, um, get your campaign signs off the side of the road, please. That was supposed to be done already, and they're still there. Get them down. Thank you. Nothing, Sean? Uh, no public service announcements. Okay. Uh, we have Andrew from Affinity on the screen. Yep. Can you hear us? Yep. Yeah. Andrew and Steve. Yep. Yep. Hello. Good evening. Okay. Good evening. Right. You have an update for us on the uh, street lighting? We do. Um, uh, good evening, everybody, uh, to Scott and the rest of you from Affinity LED. Um, thanks for that uh, that greeting of uh, and wish for veterans. As you know, we um, our company uh, assembles all of our fixtures in um, locally in Dover, New Hampshire, and our assembly team is an all veteran team. So. Um, we are also closed uh, tomorrow. Uh, a lot of businesses are not, but uh, we honor those who not only work for us, but for those who have uh, served our country. And uh, that was a, a very, very nice um, note by yourselves. So an update on, um, on the project. Um, my name is Steve Lieber. I'm the president and the founder of the company of Affinity LED and Andrew Kibo um, is our a senior project manager. Um, you uh, may notice that there's been a slight change in personnel. John Brannigan, who uh, was one of your principal contacts since the beginning of the project, um, sad day for us. John actually finished with Affinity LED after six and a half years uh, to, uh, <coughs> uh, to join, uh, to get into the renewables uh, industry. He's gone to work for a, a solar company. So we. Uh, We've had a lot of uh, transition work over the last several weeks, but officially uh, did not announce that until about two weeks ago. Um, so I think uh, you probably, Scott, have uh, maybe heard from JB, but uh, Andrew um, is a, a senior project manager and has, manager has been responsible for um, most product and technology and, uh, you know, project uh, operations for some time. Uh, and he's gonna walk you through the map. So <coughs> our update to date is, uh, update on New Ipswich is that um, all of the work that um, has been done up until now is pretty much on schedule. Um, based on the RFP, uh, we went out and uh, have done the GIS um, and have done all of the sleuthing and solving of uh, any issues to make sure that we located everything uh, that Eversource said uh, and says that you are paying for. Um, your um, ledger said 112 um, when we presented our bid to you that there were 112 lights out there in the town of New Ipswich. And we found 112 lights. Actually, we found 113. Uh, the first thing we do, uh, but we'll explain why. One of the lights that you had planned to remove, uh, Andrew, I think you had mentioned it was on Ashby. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, Ashby Road, 17 over 95-4. Uh, 
So on Ashby Road, there's uh, there's 113 currently on your ledger because one of them has not yet been removed. So we will show you in just a moment when Andrew walks you through the, the map. Um, I just want to pause there because uh, I actually need permission to uh, present um, from the host. I can't. I cannot. I have a I have a map of uh, all the auditing work we did. I'd like to share. So if uh, whoever is in charge of uh, the meeting could give me uh, sharing permission, and I could show you. Uh, let's see if that worked. Okay. Here we go. So the purpose of Andrew uh, sharing is to, uh, the last piece uh, for us to go through is actually to um, confirm the lighting plan with all of you um, to show you uh, the work that's been done to date, that all 112 lights have been identified. Um, Andrew, do you wanna change over to a, a, one of the clear base maps that might be easier to detect um, perfect? Um, so, um, what you'll see here, and then I'm going to turn it over to Andrew, is the map of uh, New Ipswich as is done by our, you know, on the ground auditors, the GIS auditors, who actually visited the town and physically located all streetlights um, on, the, um, on the ground in New Ipswich. Um, the dots that you see there, there's a few designations just really quickly to show you. The green dots and the blue dots represent 112 lights, uh, with one exception. And that's just the two different, um, if, if we can put the legend on the side there, Andrew, um, that'll show you that, you know, there are cover heads of 18 watt and 50 watt that we had presented our recommendations based on what we were taking out the traditional uh, conversions of Eversource's lights. And those are designated, as you can see, in the blue and green dots. Those will also be on the installer's iPad as they travel through the town. And those will eventually, as uh, each one gets done, will have a red X through them that shows that they've been converted. You'll also see um, in a few places, maybe Andrew, you can point to them, uh, a P um, which looks like a parking sign, but P for us actually uh, means private area light. So these aren't on your ledger, but um, what we do is we make sure that we ask Eversource for all the information. They can't disclose who those private area lights are paid for by, uh, but they do tell us that um, there are lights that need to be bypassed when uh, the installers are out there on the roads that yes, you're seeing an existing legacy light, but it's a private light and it's not the town's. Typically it's a business or a resident has requested a light. Uh, they get billed every month. Uh, every Dunkin' Donuts across the state has a private area light. Um, and those are installers know that it's located for them so they know to pass it. Um, there is one single exception of a private area light. I think there were a dozen of them in town uh, that we do have on the map as your 113th light. Um, you raised your hand. Somebody raised their hand. Do you have a question? No, I was saying goodbye to somebody that was leaving the building. Okay. <laughs> um, so there, this, this light that Andrew's pointing to that is 1 slash 111-1, uh, we wanted to show you that one because uh, the one thing that, um, because we have good relationships with uh, Eversource, they will tell us, they'll cheat a little bit and say, this is a private area light that you should know who the owner is because it happens to be the town of New Ipswich. Um, now, because it's billed, it looks like under your town hall bill, um, it's not on your, your Eversource ledger. And because it's not on your Eversource ledger, we're not allowed to change it. Uh, because the Eversource tariff uh, are currently with the P registered with the PUC only allows for municipal street lighting ledger lights to be changed to LED. The way around this that we do with have done with 50 other communities in New Hampshire is at our recommendation, we're asking that you allow us to let Eversource know that you want to remove that 
from paying because you're paying a tariff on it it's just a private area like designated differently that we remove that from the town halls bill and just put it on your town ledger so now your ledger would be 113 lights when it's corrected uh, what that'll do is allow you to terminate your private area light agreement and add that light into your your uh, Eversource street lighting ledger and then we can do that um, if that is acceptable to you um, if you need to have any discussion or whatever we will uh, go ahead but we've got that as one of the action items is to discuss moving the town hall private area light uh, Andrew will show you photographs there's a hundred watt uh, it's a white sticker 100 watt metal halide fixture that's sitting outside of the town hall yep so yeah. Yeah. No. replace it <laughs> okay so that's one action item check uh, good um, <clears throat> Andrew, I had for our second action item was to, um, sorry, for our third action item, because the, the second action item, the first action item was to make sure that the, the light on, um, was to make sure that the, the removed light is actually taken care of. And we'll, we'll take care of that Ashby Road just to make sure that um, that's 17 dash slash nine five dash four is removed um, and taken off your inventory because that was your intention um, uh, yeah yeah I was I was think I was thinking you were talking about the wrong poll but I didn't listen to the whole poll number so apologies <laughs> um, and then you'll you'll notice one other thing if we go back to the other base map uh, Andrew uh, sure. he's much faster than me on this so I don't even try. There's a there's a, a designator on the legend um, that shows like an exclamation point and it shows missing fixture. We've actually found that missing fixture, but we just want to be clear with you how we keep the records. Uh, we were looking for the fixture on Lower River Road on this pole five slash over nine dash two. It wasn't there, but just below it at at uh, pole five over nine dash one, this green dot just below it, that is where the light is actually located. So um, we've let, and we were able to see the uh, the actual uh, pole numbers on the on the poles as a benefit of the audit. So, so I mean, this this pole wasn't supposed to have a light on it. Um, mm -hmm. You'll this this pole, yeah. Yeah, if you'll show them the other photo um, in the metadata, um, this is where the auditors came back and said uh, there was a light. We couldn't find one pole. Um, Would you like to see the pole with no light on it? Is that what you're asking for? Yeah. There we go. <coughs> photograph of the pole and said, you know, we're taking this photograph instead of, of a light fixture because there is no light on it. But uh, just down the road uh, at the next pole is where it's actually located. So we're going to be updating records. It's just updating the records to let them know that the, the street light is there and you are paying for a street light that's there. It's just on a different pole. Steve, this is Dave Lage. Yeah. I'm wondering, could we receive a PDF copy of your layout so that we can print it out at a full size and review it? Oh, absolutely. Yes, I think Andrew can uh, can send that off. Um, uh, you, yeah, I mean, after the meeting. Sure, yeah. that's fine. Yeah. Is this was this the, the issue is, though, that it is uh, uh, you can't see every data point. You have to it's dynamic. So as you as you get closer, we you, might be able uh, to screenshot it, though. I think if we give you a screenshot of the town, would that uh, would that work? That that would work. Okay. All right. So let's jump back <clears throat> in through to. Uh, did you lose? I'm seeing something different here. Uh, this is the uh, okay. the full view of the full town. Okay. So the last piece we wanted to show you are the red dots. 
Actually, no, we wanted to talk about uh, the uh, the masked arm for that. Oh, correct. Um, there was one there was one fixture that we expected to find, and we didn't find a fixture there. And uh, we've spoken to Eversource about getting a mast arm put back on this hole. Right. Uh, at Main Street uh, 17 over 7-3 at Main Street and a, near a Serving Academy mm -hmm. Road. Um, the fixture's missing. Mm -hmm. So you've been paying for this, but, uh, but it hasn't actually been there. Lucky you. So one note that you might want to take is uh, is to have a conversation with Eversource about how long that mast arm and light has been missing um, and the potential that uh, perhaps you can go back in the calendar um, um, to get some credit for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how far they'll go back, but it's worth having that conversation as the customer um, to say we, you know, we've verified here on the GIS that this Main Street and Academy pole 17 backslash 7-3 uh, is not there. Now we are assuming that you want okay. that pole and uh, that pole light, pole and light in operation at that location. So we've planned to go ahead. Is it at the intersection? Yes, it's it's at the intersection of Academy and Upper School Street. Upper School Street, correct, not Main Street. Oh, yeah. Upper So with your permission, we would proceed to let Eversource know that they need to come back up last arm and wiring up make that connection um, and then uh, we'll have the fixture also installed at the same time right yeah so that would be one fixture that affinity will not handle the installation of but we will include that in the delivery of the other lights if if you want to keep this so who, uh, who installs this it? eversource eversource would put it up at the same time that the bucket is there putting up the mast arm uh, they will install this fixture, yes. So we should make arrangements with them for that, is that correct? Yes, and they, we've, we've been talking with them, uh, you know, because we, we had some questions about our findings after the audit, and, uh, and so they, they verified that, oh, yep, that was our mistake. So uh, they will have, with, with your blessing, we'll have that master put back on. So it won't be a, 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 a you know, the idea won't be a stranger to them when you talk to them about it. And I will, of course, give you the, uh, uh, in an email, I'll give you the poll number to make everything easy. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> and then, Andrew, the last piece is the red dots, which are uh, the lights that the town um, had asked for us to identify on the map um, where you had been discussing putting um, new lights in. So these red dots are listed as TBDs because we haven't identified the poles with one exception where you had given that to us on Page Hill Road, uh, 77 over 79 near the townhouses. Um, that pole is identified uh, but for these locations, we wanted to find out a little more from you uh, so that we could determine together with um, you folks whether uh, a brighter light, which is generally used at intersections and main roads, or uh, which is the 50 watt, the blue dot, or if these become an 18 watt, which is a green dot. Steve, if, we... if I recall at that area, <clears throat> It's a sharp curve in the road, and uh, which which area? There's a the one on Page Hill. Hill. <clears throat> the the seventy seven seventy nine. Oh okay, yep. That's at a very sharp curve in the road, and mm -hmm. the pole that we identified. I'm not so sure that graphically it's where you're showing because it was off 
uh, the road quite a distance, and we didn't know if the light would throw out to the road, and we were looking for your advice on that one. Okay, so each of these locations, um, let's see, 77 slash 79, looks like we'd have to get eyes on it uh, to identify a pole in that area that would be acceptable for you. We're assuming that you don't want to go to Eversource to say, we'd like a pole put in in this very specific area, because then you're talking about, I, I think. If you see um, where that cursor is right now, from mm -hmm. memory, yes. that's about the location. It was on the bend and there's a driveway there. How's that feel? Yeah, so you can see that driveway, yeah. like off the bend. I'm just trying to picture where the yeah there's the townhouses. Yes, I believe that pole would be to the left of the driveway as you come in off of Page. It was further down. It was not that pole. It's it's okay. actually more around this area here. On the right hand side, John. The right hand side. No, of the right. Yes, right there. Right, right there. It was right in that area, and we didn't know whether a mast arm and shielding or something would get the light to throw. So the main objective is that's a very sharp corner. And we thought it would be wise to have a light there. Okay. So it sounds like um, in addition to just making sure uh, that, that it will be able to reach the road, it sounds like it's probably an area where we could benefit from a brighter light since it's such a sharp turn. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so uh, for this one, we, we do know that we need to, um, a, we're gonna call this a brighter light, but we do need to identify um, uh, the pole, mm -hmm. the specific pole and get your confirmation um, Assuming it's an existing poll of where uh, where we would be locating and letting Eversource know that a mast arm would need to be installed. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, and it sounds like um, out of the nine, seven others are at intersections. You've got three on Ashby Road, intersection of Mount View and Matson, uh, Ashby Road, Malthouse Road, Ashby Road, Davis Village Road, um, two on Binney Hill at Poor Farm Road and Page Hill Road. Um, then we have another one on Page Hill, an intersection with Westbrook Drive, and one on Poor Farm Road, intersection with Lower Pratt Pond Road. So, and the only one that's not at an intersection is the one across from the fire station. And that one, we might want to go right there as well. I think that that would, I because think, that's a. Uh, I think all the other ones could be lesser because they're not. It's, what do you mean by lesser? Like they don't have to be the 50 watts, they could be the 18 watts. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave that up to you guys. What do you normally recommend at an intersection? <clears throat> Well, generally at intersections, we do go brighter, uh, but it depends on what kind of an intersection it is. Um, These are all very uh, rural. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, it's fairly common in rural areas to take uh, intersections and turn them into just another light um, and put in an 18 watt. Um, yeah. Because, you know, the benefit in a rural area is that, you know, the street light isn't fighting against any other light pollution. It's the only light, so mm -hmm. you can get away with a little less. Okay. So, yeah, I think we just wanted to confirm, you know, what type of uh, traffic these areas might see. But if, uh, if, you, if with that input that you just gave us, I think we can move confidently that these should be the 18 watts with the exception of uh, the sharp turn on uh, Page Hill. The sharp turn near Page Hill and the fire station will plan 50 watts. Again, we have to identify the specific pole and let you know uh, which pole at each of these nine locations, uh, just to sort of reconfirm with you. And then the other seven intersection locations 
we will assume for now that an 18 watt fixture will be what we'll use for those. And again, we'll, we're gonna have to put our eyes on this. Um, so we'll send somebody to specifically look um, at those intersections, at the, the, the turn at Page Hill and at the fire station, just confirm poll numbers and come back to you probably via email unless you'd like us to meet again uh, via Zoom. Um, and let you know what our recommendation is, because obviously we want your approval um, directly before we proceed and make any of these changes. Are any of are these light fixtures like a long lead time? I'm wondering if once you start installing, if you're doing 18 watts, that we'd be able to see, oh, this is what an 18 watt is the brightness of then say, yes, let's bump it up or leave it at 18? Well, you know, that's a good point, actually, because these locations don't have mast arms. So Eversource would have to add that, and that's, that, that's their own delay. So we could deliver as planned for your leisured lights. You can see how that goes, and Eversource is going to have to handle the installation of these regardless, just like that, uh, that one light that was missing. Mm -hmm. So this doesn't have to hold up the project, and yeah, you can use the initial part of the installation to, uh, you know, make your decision. That's perfect, Andrew. That's a great idea. <laughs> these 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 questions and Andrew's answer. That's why I like him so much. Um, <laughs> uh, that make complete sense. We'll you know, install the existing lighting plan on the 113 lights, the 112 plus the the private area light. Let you take a look at how the lights are. And before Eversource comes in to put the mast arms and put up the new lights, you'll have time to make a decision to say make those 18s or 50s. Cool. Sounds good. So yeah, that's that's a great idea. Thanks. So we have we have the uh, the ledgered lights uh, plus uh, that that uh, municipal private area light at your your town hall ready to go. Um, so the uh, the only the only blessing we need is uh, where to deliver, and then um, we can uh, line up the installer. They'll be delivered to the town office complex, building three, now, which you is have the highway place, department. Is, oh, to the, high, the highway department? Is there a highway garage there? Is yes. Is the big white building in the back? It's behind the white building. Okay. And who is, uh, who's the contact person for that delivery? Um, is it, uh, is it, it you, Scott? Well, you can either contact me or you can contact Peter Goey, who is our DPW director. So it'll be this building here. There's a the, uh, garage door in the back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. The dark. The yeah. Darker. yeah, and they're they're already aware that they need to make space. You, you said they're around thirty eight totes altogether. Yeah, yeah I'm looking at them. Less, you're, you're probably talking about uh, a couple pallets worth of space. It's not big. Um, you have them right here. We got plenty of room. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, so we see the extra still in the facility. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we get tomorrow off. It's okay. <laughs> Um, well, how did you spell Peter's last name? G O E W E Y. All right. And you said he's the director. Right, DPW director. The good news is, um, you know, assembly is in. I think I think everything's ready. But the good news is, is you know, lead time uh, depends on when Andrew sends a signal over to the operations manager and says. Put this in the queue this morning. Uh, it's ready tomorrow. <laughs> so any adjustments or changes, uh, that's the beautiful thing about having our own assembly is we can flex and, uh, and revise as needed because our guys are basically building street lighting and indoor smart lighting um, all day, every day, um, and just taking cues on what's the priority. So we're pretty fortunate. We're pretty fortunate to get the support of obviously communities like yourselves, uh, over 80 of them now between uh, in Northern New England um, on street lighting projects as well as in interior municipal projects, schools, town halls, 
highway garages, et cetera. So um, we appreciate uh, you selecting us, obviously, as do our, our veterans who uh, do great work, um, certainly. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if you've had any of that discussion, but any, um, any uh, potential buildings that you would like us to take a look at, uh, you know, we don't charge a cost to give you a proposal um, for town hall, DPW, schools, whatever, um, uh, because it's uh, the the current obviously the street lighting tariff is is uh, is very advantageous in Eversource territory, but also uh, just you know general buildings it's even more advantageous because it's not tariffed. What you reduce your costs, you save a um, hundred percent of on uh, town owned lighting wherever it is inside or out. So um, we're happy to uh, at your direction. Um, uh, do audits of any facilities that you'd like us uh, to look at with no obligation of course if you'd like to take a look at that building when you drop off the totes that's one that we've looked at recently and thought that some led lighting high bay fixtures out in that garage and uh, you'll find it's all high bay ceilings throughout <clears throat> well turns out that our delivery guy is also one of our auditors so that, that seems to work out. Good. Yeah. A quick question uh, for you two. Uh, I, I did have a business owner approach me. They have a fixture that they pay for now um, and uh, was wondering whether they could kind of jump on to the bandwagon and pay to have that swapped out. Is that something you'd entertain? Um, is that a, a street light? That they're yeah. paying for private area light. I believe so. Is uh, if that is something that they can make arrangements with the town. Um, well, with EverSource, right? Uh, well, they'd have to they have to cancel their private area light agreement. Uh, currently, private area light agreements can't change the LED. They don't have uh, a means to do that. Uh, what what can be done, uh, and we've done this in several communities where uh, residents or businesses have just made their own agreements with the town or city um, to reimburse those costs on a regular basis. So, uh, because we, you know, we can tell you what the tariff cost is every month or on an annual basis. Um, if you can make those arrangements with them, um, we can coordinate some of the conversation with. Eversource and your um, uh, your town business about switching that over, but I, it, for certain it would have to get onto your ledger. Okay, yeah, we probably that, wouldn't want to pursue that then. <laughs> yeah, it might be a little bit complicated. Uh, it's we know that in other communities, uh, the town of Newcastle had a whole bunch of these uh, more of these private area light agreements than they had street lights and. Uh, they went through a lot of trouble uh, to, to do these conversions and make these you know, independent agreements with residents. Uh, it, what, it's not easy. And your, your town statutes might prohibit it. Uh, right. The same. Yeah, we don't want to make it too complicated. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. We look okay, good. We're looking forward to the new fixtures. Thank you very much. Um, right, and I'll send that email off shortly with the uh, the, the few uh, action items you speak to Eversource about, and then I'll work with Peter to get the delivery underway. Okay, so thank delivery you. happens, and then we'll update you on, we'll get you in the queue right away. Um, I don't want to speak for Andrew, who coordinates the, the installations, but I would say within, now we're talking within a few weeks, uh, we should Certainly. get in there and get that done. It's just a matter of getting the electrician on the phone. Very good. Sometimes harder than it looks. Great. Okay. Thank, thank you so good. much. Cool. Thank you very thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank Happy you. Veterans Day to those who served. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank Have a good evening. Bye. You as well. I see.
referred to backup in your email that you had sent Scott yesterday. Mm -hmm. What was that in reference to? When any of the budgets are presented, mm -hmm. it should be providing the substantiation of how they arrived at the budget. It's yeah. not just copying last year and saying, Pulling it over, yeah. yeah. So each line would get it, like an explanation <coughs> of. Oh, the... yeah. It, you know, in some cases, like when we are talking, you know, office supplies or something, they you know just gives a blur of, you know, toner and that kind of stuff. But more of the big ticket items you need to have back up for how you arrive at the numbers. Yeah. So did you get that or no? no. No, I uh, <clears throat> unfortunately, you know, honestly, just don't have the time to to gather all this. Most of this budget is, um, uh, you know, pretty straightforward as far as how these numbers are arrived at. A lot of them are level funded. Uh, they do fall into you know categories like dues and fees. You know, things that are that are consistent year to year. Um, <clears throat> So, I mean, I can certainly provide all that information. Uh, it, you know, for, for this particular budget, I think it's, um, you know, it's a tremendous uh, amount of effort for something that I think uh, we could probably just talk through to, on how I arrived at the numbers uh, that I have here. Well, even if it's level funded and hasn't changed much since last year, was there some type of backup? Last so, year. I, I mean, honestly, I, I can give you a printout of every transaction on every line item and how it was charged, if that's the level of detail that you want, so you can see what's been spent. You can't always predict in the future what it's going to be. I mean, there are, you know, general supply lines. You know, we, we can't anticipate. You know, it's kind of like building maintenance. We have a lump sum. We try to use it to the best of our ability uh, to get things done. But you can't predict from year to year necessarily what exactly each oh, increment of money is going to be. I get that, but that's yeah. kind of like the whole point of like the doing the budget process is yeah. to try to like it, give your best estimate. It, it wasn't. I had the backup from like there's not. It's not a lot of backup from last year. It was a lot of it was substantiating um, requests made for labor adjustments, hmm. salaries adjustments. That's most of what the backup was for last year. But we asked. No, I understand that. I'm just saying he, he asked what what did we have backup last year and. And last year it kind of slipped, mm -hmm. and then this year it seems to be taking yeah. the same route. And I, to me, to understand a budget, I need to know where it came from. Uh, I know we discussed at times about trying to bring in additional help. Well, now it's the budget season. Now is when we have to do it. So we have to look at, okay, what have we got our employees here for working for hours? Do we need to add another part-time person? How do we allocate that? And unless we can see that, and I'm talking myself, because mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know what you guys need to understand, but for me to understand it, I need to see the numbers. I, I could say, you know, let's throw another twenty thousand at it or something. But I mean, I, I look at. It as, I mean, I, there's a couple things that you know. Yeah, I want to discuss. But I mean, for the most part, I on certain budgets, you know, this one being a lot of the stuff. Like you said, it's it's a lot of fixed costs, things we can't. You know, and if there is an adjustment, is it because the cost went up? That's all I need to know. Um, I mean, I think as far as um, the discussion of any additional help in the office. Um, I think we've discussed more or less um, just the opposite, um, that uh, there's a lot of wasted time and that when it came down to it and the option was there for additional overtime because someone said we needed all these people then all of a sudden they didn't have the work to do so we don't need the people i think it's more a matter of getting the people to do be more efficient in their jobs and if they can't do that then getting a person in the job that is efficient um, just to 
that one point because yeah we have talked in years past about oh we need the th we need more people we need more time and then all of a sudden we realize hey we really don't hmm. so i guess for me this being my first budget season like not knowing what is included in each line item like right off the top like the office salaries i'm assuming that's you just you that is just me and then the clerical assistant that's, would be <clears throat> that's roger uh that's susan who's going to be coming on board mm -hmm. uh and that's debbie <clears throat> and again now going back to your comment mm -hmm. we need to be looking this is next year's budget okay Debbie's trying to fill three roles right now, mm -hmm. looking to go to a different role. Mm -hmm. And so now we're going to have new people trying to come in and cover different tasks. How are we going, how are we planning to do that? And those are the types of things that I'd see in numbers and hours to say, this is how it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Scott mentions at times like, well, it'd be nice to have somebody take meeting minutes, okay? Is that something that we're adding to a new employee's duties? How do we handle those types of things? And now is the time to be discussing it. Yeah, to add that person or that time. Yeah. Yeah, within, so it's like finding out what the plan is like what you need going forward next year. But I mean, even cons go consulting services. I think that's uh, that's Joanne. Joanne. Yep. Okay. So, do we know that we've been trying to come up with a plan to get the office to operate more efficiently? Mm -hmm. Do we need to look at that and say, okay, we're going to need her in here more than what we had this year, because this year it may have been more of answering questions, but if we're trying to get, make improvements, and we're going to rely on that consultant more for the year, we need to budget for it. Mm -hmm. It just has that dialogue, mm -hmm. and we've asked for it, and... I was expecting to see it. This is, is that? yeah, that's a separate, separate budget for town clerk's office. Okay. Yeah. The, the, the 3,600 is, um, 3% increase plus an adjustment for, um, performance or performance adjustment. Isn't that what the increase is usually for? Or is the increase an annual increase that we're obliged to give? We're not obliged to give anything, but we, we budget at 3%, and Scott discussed yeah. a while back that he was looking to make some additional adjustments to employees that have gone above and beyond. Or, okay. like they said, if we're going to ask people, if we, if we have a current employee that moves to a new position and we bring somebody else in, that's a perfect time to ask them to do some additional tasks that aren't listed now. So then that money's now budgeted in there to, you know, have them say, take minutes for a couple hours a night or something like that. So, 
So, uh, and just so I'm clear on the, the office salary, Scott, you're the only one in that category, is that right? That is correct. Okay. So when I look at our costs, essentially 14,000 of the 16,000 increase is all oriented around salaries and, and the rest is sort of give or take going down the columns. And it sounds like all of that is based on incremental performance increases and, uh, and raises. And, and then the subsequent costs are health insurance. <clears throat> health insurance, I assume, me uh, Medicare, FICA, retirement is all a, a proportional function of the increase in the salaries. Is that right? Right. <clears throat> and retirement uh, has, you know, the major retirement system has changed their rates effective July 1st, so halfway through the fiscal year. It's going to jump from the current 11.17% employer contribution to 14.06. So the average for the year is 12.62. Yeah. So that's what that number is based on. It's something we don't have okay. control over. Um, yeah. FICA and Medicare are, are still the same percentages. Our dental and life insurance stayed flat this year. The health insurance, <clears throat> I have 6% built into this budget, and I just got the, sat with the, uh, our health insurance provider last night, and unfortunately, 6% might not be enough. That's something, uh, that's a separate discussion I'm gonna have to have with the selectmen because, uh, you know, healthcare is, uh, is always, always uh, an issue. And uh, even at the 6% that I have in here, um, you know, the plan that we're currently on is not gonna be offered. So we're, we're gonna be paying more money for a slightly lesser plan. Um, so, you know, that's just, yeah, I mean, that's just the way the ind that industry is going, unfortunately. Can we just renew Yeah, they do it all the time. I see it at my employer. So. Health? Yeah. We just did that within the last year. Yes. Yeah, you do it every year. <clears throat> yeah, so you don't, want, unfortunately, you can't lock in a price with health insurance. Yeah, it happens yearly. Well, should we be seeking pricing yearly? I thought we did. Yeah. Don't well, we, don't we. if we did and we signed a contract and then the following year the pricing can change, then should we be... And look at it again. Look at it again. Right. Can't forecast it very Yeah. Easy. Yeah, that's a complicated subject. For sure. You know, just just look at the spreadsheets. <laughs> There's on the consulting on the consulting, Scott, the eight fifty increase is because we have some additional consulting work we want done and, and Yes. <clears throat> so I, I'm, what I'm trying to do is, and I've discussed this with the selectmen, is I need to start making changes in the financial side of our operations here. And I want to start shifting responsibilities and improving some of our processes to satisfy some of the concerns that the auditors have had. All right. Let me, I want to yeah. do a timeout here because this is in my craw. Mm -hmm. We discussed a week, two weeks ago, I was not comfortable reviewing the budget without the backup. We still don't have the backup. I'm not comfortable going forward without it. We can be sitting here talking through different things, but I'd like to have the opportunity to see the backup ahead of time, then we can have a discussion. I agree. Then I'll, I will go with you two on that. That's fine. I mean, we. We have to have the backup. We've been, for 10 years, we've been with department heads that, you know, telling them, tell the line, we need the backup. Yeah. I Something to look at. Yeah. To it out. It, it, yeah. It, and I don't want to be struggling through this because when I try and look up how we get to these points without knowing that information. It's That's different. why you asked me. I have it written down. I know, but you're not always here. <laughs> <laughs> and where's the backup from last year? I told you I have it. It's in here. Yeah. Huh? 
And I did find my book from last year, so I have my book, but I mean, when I'm going to a new budget, you know, if I'm sitting at home and I want to say, well, why is this going up, I can look at it, you know. Without that information, I think it's... uh, Well, especially when you get into the um, employee part, you know, like what that money is going to get you, how many people, like where they're going to be positioned. And do we take it from here and put it there? You know, it's different... Does it make sense to identify a trip level for the backup, Dave? I mean, do you really care about backup for a $100 increase? No, I don't. I'm more of knowing how a number got there. When it's a a number such as, if we're going to be having a discussion on, and I'm just going back to it, the uh, financial consultant. Okay. So how many hours am I getting up for this amount of money? And do we figure that X amount of hours a week? Do we need to bump it, reduce it, leave it as it is? But it's good to know what those numbers are. Okay, so you're looking for a baseline. You're not looking for a delta backup. You're looking for a baseline. Correct, the baseline, baseline. yes. As we've always emphasized is that it's a zero-based budget. In other words, you're starting with what do I need for next year? Not, well, this is what I had last year. I'm just going to do the same thing. It, it's yep. more yep. to get that thought process going. For example, uh, regional associations, if these are just what they're telling us we're getting billed, then that's an easy budget to review. There's nothing that you're going to get a backup on, as long as these are numbers that are coming from those associations. These two numbers you have in here, I'll assume, are based on. Yes. Um, they can put the billing for next year is going to be. Yeah, they normally send a letter to say, you know, if you do this so next year, it's going to be X yeah. from Southwest Planning. and. Uh, so even this, though, like simply it would just be those two sheets, like right sheet. in there, yeah. so that we have it. That makes sense. So it's kind of going through that with the ambulance last night in their budget, like as they're trying to create theirs. Mm-hmm. You know, because Wendy's like new, like to that role. Yeah. And just going through the backup, and just because it's done this way for the last many years doesn't have to be, you know, like just keep projecting out and adding a little bit. Because if your actuals are lower, then it's okay to, you know, make an adjustment in one and offset something else. Yeah. 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 And that's. In my mind, has always been the budget process. We always look and say, okay, maybe we can't spend it here, and we've got some from here. Yep. Yeah, we alloc- allocate stuff. Yep. yep. So? Trying to deal with the associations? Yeah, I'm fine with the associations. Government buildings on here. 
Yeah, yeah. again, the, the unfortunate thing is, you know, Mark and I um, sat down Monday to kind of go through building by building what we thought we were going to need. Um, the problem is I can't manufacture time. I don't have time. I'm out of time. Now, <clears throat> most days lately, the only two people that are in this building are me and Debbie. And we're doing 80% of the work that this town office needs to have done. We're both working 50, 60 hours a week, trying to serve the public and get things done. I don't have time. I'm out of time. I'm doing things to support the town clerk's office, you know, you know, Debbie's trying to do the land use and the town clerk's office. Today she had to jump in and do payroll because Roger's on vacation again. It's, we don't have the time. So as much as I would have loved to have all the detail that you're looking for, it takes a lot of time to do that. And, um, you know, we had this discussion a couple of weeks ago, I believe. Um, it is, uh, just a matter of not having resources. Now we got Margie on board today, so we have a new person in the town clerk's office and we have somebody to, uh, to be uh, re replaced, Laurie, hopefully on board in the next two to three weeks. Right now, Debbie and I, we don't have the ability to delegate anything to anybody because there's nobody to delegate it to. So we have to take care of what's walking through the door and, to, and serving the public as best we can. To give you an idea, because there is nobody in the town clerk's office, those phone calls are being forwarded to my phone. Last week, I received 374 phone calls, resulting in 75 voicemails of people that needed to be responded to. There is nobody here that can re return those calls except me and Debbie. And she's getting her own list of calls. No. I, I, I'm just saying. No, I don't. Uh, Can I just okay, we're, we're, we're two people trying to run this whole building. We understand what time of year it is. All three of us appreciate that okay. and understand it. And if we could just pause like, and not go down a road, like, it's not the forum right now. Because I, like, I, I can make comments. <clears throat> I don't want to make comments. Okay? And it's not against you. It's just... I don't think that it's not, that's not what we're supposed to be doing right now. No, I agree. But I, uh, you know, we had our discussion a couple of weeks ago. You understand my frustrations. Mm -hmm. Scott, is it not feasible then to rearrange this schedule for presenting budgets that you would be compiling and bring in the other departments. So I'm trying to give my other departments an opportunity so that they can prepare. That's why I put myself at the front of the pack. All right? Because they need time as well because we are on a compressed schedule and we're trying to get through this so that we don't run into the situation we ran into last year where we had our backs against but they should all have been working on their budgets. There's nobody. So and they are, and they are. But it, it, you know, they're they're working on. Them. They have they have their worksheets. Uh, they have some of the you know the other backup information that they wanted. I produced some reports out of that Roger normally gives them that I produced out of uh, BMSI today, so that they could see what their year-to-date spending was by department by line item. So they are being supplied with the information. But again, every time I'm, you know, pulled off to do, you know, one of the hundred things that are going on in any given day, it's time taken away from something else. And until we get the full staff in here and get people trained and up, up, up to speed, it's going to be a challenge. I think that the department heads should be able to develop their budgets without you having to spoon feed them information. They should know what they been spending, they should know what they need for next year, and they know what their costs are for next year, and be able to and, gather that information. And, and I would say that they, they have a pretty good grasp on that, but they still want to have 
up-to-date information on their expenditures so that they can understand where they stand today and what they should be planning for for next year. But somebody has to run those reports. And that happens to, you know, right now, that's me. And, um, you know, it's just, just the way it is. We're trying to, trying to take a, a, a finite amount of bandwidth and, you know, we're fitting 10 pounds of sugar into a five pound bag in some cases, and that's, you know, we're pedaling as fast as we can. Uh, yep. Since I didn't find a tab. That says any of this. Um, it should say regional associations. Oh, region. Mm -hmm. Down as approved, like tonight, or yeah, no, what I wind up doing is you can do, yeah, yeah approved. I put it in on a spreadsheet just to keep track to say, okay, we've done that budget now. We'll just yeah, keep going. what yeah, I'm trying to look at right now is I know Scott sent out a email with a schedule for the budget reviews, and I'm trying to find that to see who's on for next week. So next week is Conservation, ZBA, Assessors, and Heritage Commission. Have you heard from all of them I as far as their... I don't think ZBA met last week. I know I wasn't at that meeting and I checked with the vice chair. He wasn't at it, so I don't know if they met or not. Can you read that list again? It's ZBA, Conservation. Assessors and Heritage. Since you had brought up time allocation, needing more resources, what would be an appropriate point to talk about all that? During the budget for the BOS office. Like for the BOS? Yep. Yeah. 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 So I think some of the, like the issue is like not forecasting out I know you can't see everything, but just, and then filling roles as fast as possible, like when the decision's made or when someone leaves, right? Like a more efficient replacement of people who leave. Well, you got to get an application out there and get applicants <coughs> back. It's yeah. No, I know. I know. It's, it's a process, but yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean we, we've put out an application before. You get 
30, and out of the 30, there's one that might even be worth talking to. People just see, oh, office, yeah, I, I can answer phones, and they hit apply. But I think where recently they had two applicants. Yeah, for when it came down to it. Right. That position. So we might, if things change. But for discussions now, mm -hmm. okay, we're mid November. Budget's going to affect January 1st. No. Okay. Debbie's intention is to run for the position of town clerk tax collector. Why would we not want to bring on the second person now? Correct. And then what if someone else runs and she's not elected? It's still a part-time position. Mm, technically, we need another person. No, we don't. Oh. Again, well, I don't want to be in the resources. position of <laughs> having one person trying to do the work of two when that one person is new. Don't speak. Speak. We're filling a role that doesn't need to be filled in case. In case. Well, you're like you're saying, okay... You're saying you want to start to fill a role because someone's going to run for an elected position. So in right now, that person's trying to cover the three different roles. Right, which, we, which we've filled one and we're filling another. So of the three, we've got two of them filled. Wait a minute. No, no, no. What is the second one that we've filled? We have an assistant town clerk task collector and we've filled Lori's spot. Laurie spot. Okay. Right. So you're so, so now, all of a sudden we've got one person who's no longer filling three, she's filling one. But you, you're missing the position of the town clerk tax collector that you've had. You don't have anybody in that role. <clears throat> we do because right now we have one, she's just not working. So what I'm saying is you're you're saying let's fill a role in case someone is elected to that position. Who's currently filling? So you're saying, in case Debbie gets elected to town clerk, task collector, we should already have somebody in the pipeline. Well, what if she isn't elected? Okay. Now we've got now we've hired someone for no reason. So I'm just going to throw this scenario out. At one point, we had a town clerk, tax collector, a deputy. Mm -hmm. We had Debbie and Lori, and Scott was still saying he didn't have time enough time to get to meeting minutes and some other thing like other things. That we asked of him to yeah. do like so that was way back then now fast forward and even though we've added two people you really still need the third and then that's still going to leave him short potentially no because well, we we also had the discussion i think two months ago when the all the extra hours became available and they weren't being used we basically gave the person carte blanche to work whatever hours they wanted to, and they said there wasn't enough work in here for them to do, so they weren't working extra hours. But they have been. I You've been looking at the payroll? I don't know. If now they a, have, yes. Yeah. I don't know if that was a statement that was made, that there wasn't enough work. I think the person was trying to honor their original. But they were. They had and, already and, been and told they didn't have to. on the back burner. But as a result... The person has been working extensive overtime, okay? We don't have, in all reality, with her running or not, okay, somebody that's going to run that's already certified and ready to go. Mm -hmm. So for three months, 25% of the year, we're going to have the need for that town clerk tax collector position to be filled. And if that means that we have to go out and hire somebody part-time to come in and learn and help and get trained, I say it's a well, it's a good investment. If she doesn't get elected and she stays in her current position, then we have to do something with that new hire. 
whether it's that they get terminated or reduced hours or whatever, but for 25% of the year, I don't want to be going through this. Why? What do we, it's not costing us anymore. So I just, I think that there's, before we did that, I think there's other things we should look at. And that's fine. Which we have to, I okay. have on my notes to discuss afterwards. Okay, good. So to address Sean's um, comments, so we had the two land use people, we increased their hours from 28 a piece to 30 a piece last year. Mm -hmm. So we have a total of 60 man hours. As a result of that, even when Laurie was here, we were talking about switching up some of the responsibilities so that I could get more administrative support. Mm -hmm. Laurie ended up leaving, but honestly, Susan, who we just uh, accepted our offer, yeah, I envision her having enough time to get me the support that I need without hiring an incremental person to do it. Because I don't think the work was, the work balance between the two positions was necessarily optimal. That would leave, um, uh, you know, yet to be determined, but depending on how we break up, you know, the building department, ZBA, conservation, planning, and assessors between those two positions, I'm confident that the 60 hour man hours that we have budgeted for those two positions, that that's enough. I don't think we need an incremental person. And I, I, I feel pretty confident on that. The, I like what David's proposing in that we may have to make a decision on what happens with the town clerk's position sooner rather than later. And the second candidate that we were considering to take the role that Susan eventually got hired for, that person could get in here and start <coughs> understanding the land use side while Debbie is still somewhat able to help get her trained, get her up to speed so that if Debbie has to move over to the town clerk's office full-time, then we already have a person that's somewhat prepared to take on all of those responsibilities because they've had 90 days worth of transition. Now, there is a cost to that, for sure. So I just know since I've been here, it's like I get two different tales of the tape. I hear over and over and over again how you don't have enough time. It's like it's always time, didn't have enough time, don't have enough time. But then on the back side of it, you're saying that the people that are here, they like, could have been working, like yes. supporting you more yes. at that time. Yes, as it turns out, that's the way I feel. Yeah. So I just, I don't no, quite I, understand the well, two things as you had that full support at one point. No, he didn't. No? No. No. He had people filling the roles. There were people in the chairs. They yeah, weren't doing yeah, the support. Wouldn't that come down to management of it had employees? it came down to like just like I just just like the other offices because you, it's you're, it's, you're it's too drastically working efficiently. Different, two drastically different statements that you've made where you don't feel like we need more time for people or employees, but then at the same time you not having enough time. Are you taking so, on too much? So here's, here's the reality. Not, so, so those two positions, when I, when I came on board a year ago, those two positions were dedicated to land use activities and Laurie kind of being the receptionist and the webmaster and, you know, all of those things as well. And um, when we got the two hours last spring, that's when we started discussing about moving some responsibilities around so that I could get alleviated. Mm -hmm. So we had a lot of things happen uh, that kind of... Uh, no, I know, but I get those, the whole year, yeah. <laughs> those, yeah. those plans on, on hold, or at least put them in slow motion, but the intention was, and I was certainly having discussions with Laurie about taking on 
more responsibilities, and she was more than willing to, to uh, you know, help support me and my efforts in my office to take things off my desk that she could take care of. So we were moving that way, and we had COVID hit. Lori ended up taking the job in Ringe. Uh, so a lot of those things that we were talking about moving toward just never, never happened. Before. And I look at it as right now, able to leave. Where, you, where they keep saying that Debbie's filling three positions. So you're basically asking her to fill 60 hours plus another 40 hour job. She's not working 100 hours right now. Mm -hmm. She's not. So they're still short. Scott's still picking up the slack because you don't have one person working 100 hours. You know, so I look at it as once you get those other positions filled and you have two 30s and a full-time town clerk task collector, I think you have suddenly, you know, and I'm not saying your, your idea isn't bad, but I want to talk about that somewhere else first. Mm -hmm. um, but I look at it as, you know, I think what, just like we have in several of the other offices, we have inefficient labor, not, not enough labor. We have. So wouldn't that fall on Scott though? Like if he's not making those, let, like you keep focusing on the people when we have like our, it, like. Yep, and I also look at it as those people had been here before Scott walked in the door. Mm -hmm. They had an idea of what their job roles were within this office. Yeah. And we had just, like Scott said, we had just gotten to that point where he wanted to start changing things to realign those roles so that they fit more of what this office needed to do. And then every other domino fell, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah, last year we came in and Scott came to us and said, you know, they're saying they don't have enough time. They can't do this. They can't do this. And we said, okay, we'll give this amount. And then later on, I think you were here when he basically came in and went, yeah, the, we don't have all that work to fill 60 hours only yeah. doing land use. But at that point, so even... Like at that point, minutes was an issue. Like it's been an issue since day one or the first meeting. Like it could have been, well, you're gonna like take these minutes, I'll record it, you type up the minute. I'm not trying to tell you what to do like for your job, mm -hmm. but a lot of, but since we're on this budget, it's it seems to fall like on your shoulders of like, what's your correction? And that's why for the 2021, what's your plan? Like in these roles, like how are we gonna fix this so that and is there a way that we can incorporate another person or like, how can we not fall into this like trap again? Well, uh, as I said, with Susan coming on board, you know, uh, and the reason why I kind of tweaked her title instead of land use clerk, it's land use administrative assistant, uh, is because I expect her and, I, and from day one, she's gonna come in and do the minutes for these meetings. Now, does she have to come to the meeting to do that? She doesn't. We record our meetings, so you know there's going to be rare opportunities where I may have to, uh, you know, either be taking notes or you know put it on a small recorder or something like that. I'm probably going to have to do the non-public versions of the, the you know, when we have them. Mm -hmm. But the rest of it, there's no reason why during her regular hours, you know, Monday through Thursday, that she can't. Uh, do the minutes for the selectmen's meetings, and that's a that that takes you know two hours, you know a, a, a meeting at least off of my shoulders. Yeah. Uh, and you know there are other things that I want her to do on you know the HR benefit side because right now honestly we're you know the way we're doing it is. But this would this would all be good in the deep like a deep like a written detail to look at what we're going to look forward to next year how like another budget cycle is not going to come because from what I'm understanding last year's was late and slow and then you know so this year again late and slow granted but we didn't have COVID last year so it's kind of like how are we going to get out of this 
late, slow, and up against, backs up against the wall. You know, because now we're well, talking I, I, about I in, se- in between August and September about not yeah. being in this position, and now we're here yeah. in this position. I mean, between COVID, losing staff, mm-hmm. uh, whether you know for a variety of reasons, uh, the TLR event, which took up a, a tremendous amount of my time and Tim's time uh, preparing for that and corresponding with the parties, um, you know, we lost the summer. The summer, you know, August is when I wanted to kick off you know, the budget discussions with my department heads. Well, but this that, isn't. This is highly important too. Like we well, need this well, I before agree. January. I agree, but like I said, I can't manufacture time for myself. Mm-hmm. I, all right, I, let's move on. You know, uh, we can talk about this all night, but if we're going to focus on, uh, yeah, yeah, that, yeah, we'll be better off to yeah. handle that. Uh, uh, under old and new business, uh, do we have any update on the lease agreement for lease station? Comments back or anything? So, no, no comments back. Okay. Um, one of the real estate brokers representing the buyer, you know, wanted to know if we were ready to move on it, and I said, "Move on what? We don't have a lease." Um, you know, I said we have a a proposal, but I said I don't have a lease document for the selectmen to review to be able to make a decision on. But then I anticipated that once we incorporated some of the changes, the extra space, and some modifications to the building into the lease, that I didn't anticipate that you were going to object to moving forward with, with it unless there was something in there that, that really derailed it. So um, that's where we're at. We don't have a document to review. We don't have a document for town council to review uh, before um, we, we sign it. I'd like to propose that we give them a deadline. Uh, we're in the budget setting process and we're going to need to know those numbers. So yep. uh, if you spoke to them Last week, I'd say by the end of the month, to ask them to make sure they have a proposal well, to us. I'm hoping we're going to have it by the end of next week. So we all hope, yeah. but unless mm-hmm. we give it to them in writing now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so is that we're going to the end of next week? I say by the end of the month. End of the month. Yeah. Okay. You know, obviously, oh. the sooner the better. At the end of next week's week, and then it's already been on the table now for what? Almost two weeks. Well, it wasn't until last week that uh, we even got a proposal. Got back to them with. Um, oh, the week before the election, right? Mm, yeah, it was a week. Last be- week. It was we, a week before the election. We asked. We, we told them about the police station. The town. Was that the Thursday after the election. I thought it was after the election that I walked the police. Station. Oh, I didn't know you went and walked the police. Station. Yeah, I went and walked the police okay. station. Yeah. All right. Yes, you did know. No, I didn't. I knew. I yeah. feel like I thought we had like a Remember full we on discussion about, about it. Remember we talked about making a second egress out of the police station? Yeah, that was at our meeting before the election. That was before you the election. You should have been doodling. That was before the election. Yeah, it was before the election. Was it? Yeah, yeah. at our 1027. When we talked about yeah, can we? Yeah, yeah. yeah, can we so get the doctor's we, office with the second egress? We would take that. a walk there to see okay. how we could make it work. You know? Okay. Yeah. All right. David didn't invite us to walk the police station with him. No, it was like, I thought it wasn't a quick email from Scott or something. No, I'm trying to think. We had just walked something. Oh, it was the day. No, it was the day that uh, we did the we did the uh, review of the boilers at the fire station in here. Oh, okay. Okay, that's what it was. Yeah, and we went right after. I remember we went someplace. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Scott, since you're strapped for time, would you like me to handle uh, the discussion with Episource to get them out of here to do the energy review of the buildings? Um, I, I have not heard back from from um, the contact. You had a different name than the one that Doug had. 
it, I think he had both at one time. So, so they were, so both Margaret and Kristen were copied on the email, so they mm -hmm. should have both seen it. Would you like me to follow up? Sure. Me? I'd be happy to let you do it. like broadband connectivity expansion um, I forwarded a picture of that form that we had in the, the communications folder over to Lou and Craig <coughs> and, me. and uh, Craig had gotten back to me um, and I guess he was aware of those links and all that going on and that they were awaiting the release of the SB 170s to our internet providers. Do you know anything about that? Or? They do. All right. I don't know what list. it is. I have yeah. no idea. It's yeah. on my list. They drafted two letters that they want me to basically sign on behalf of the town and send it off to the uh, Comcast and uh, Consolidated. Mm -hmm. And what's the gist of those? Uh, well, basically, the uh, SB 170 requires uh, both of those utilities to give us a, um, uh, a document showing the density of their internet capability in, within the community. Mm. And what, what you know, Lou and, and Craig uh, are trying to do is identify where internet accessibility is thin in town and go back to each of those vendors and maybe pressure them to uh, you know, increase the density and or look for other alternatives or other funding sources etc and Southwest Regional Planning Commission has a broadband uh, group that's working on some things and there is occasionally grant money available to help communities build out the rest of it if the utilities are unwilling to do it themselves. Okay. Right. But you do have that request from them? I do. Okay. Um, how are our police cruisers doing? Well, <laughs> the, um, so the 2020 has had a series of of issues. Um, you know, we had the transmission replaced mm -hmm. when Jim went to pick it up. It wasn't running correctly. They had to re replace a coil pack and fuel injectors. Yeah. Uh, when he got it back, the most recent, oh, then when he picked it up, then they informed him that it needed an entire new exhaust system, which I think has been installed already by Ford yeah. for warranty. I mean, keep in mind the car is 2,600 miles on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tim and, and the police officers noticed that it seemed to be low on antifreeze and down two quarts of oil. So Tim was monitoring that to see if that oil and fluid consumption, because when you have antifreeze and oil down at the same time, that sometimes means a blown head gasket. Yeah. So uh, Tim's monitoring that to see uh, how that's doing. Last I checked with him, he thinks it's stabilized so maybe after they did the transmission some of the other work they just didn't top off the fluids yeah but we're concerned and he's concerned enough that he's questioning whether we should move forward with the second 2020 Ford Explorer or switch it up and move to a Chevy Tahoe or a Dodge Durango instead because he started to question uh, the new new Explorers this first year of production and um, He's been calling around to other departments. Some of them are, you know, are having similar issues that we have with the transmission in particular, mm. uh, as well as some other uh, glitches with the 2020 Explorers. And so he's getting nervous enough that he's gonna start exploring what the other alternatives uh, are. 
Have we issued a purchase order for the second one? We did. It's waiting for us. But the problem is, we the reason we haven't taken it is the car that, that we're taking out of the service, we couldn't take out of service because we needed it. Because no. the other 2020 was at Townsend Ford for over a month. But are we service. committed to the one that's sitting waiting? So um, MHQ might be flexible on that. If we're really dissatisfied with the Ford Explorer, uh, they may uh, allow us to um, uh, walk away from that and pick. They sell the Tahoe, they sell the Durango. So there are other options there uh, to take a look at. So I don't think we're, we're not entirely locked into the, the second Ford Explorer. Um, and, and Tim's considering that even if he just out of sheer need, we take the second <coughs> 2020 Explorer, that the next vehicle might not be a Ford Explorer and it might do something different. Because no matter what we do now, any vehicle that we <coughs> needs a full change out anyway for equipment because you can't transfer a lot of the model specific from the old style Explorer to the new style Explorer anyway. Mm -hmm. So switching to a Dodge or a Chevy isn't going to make any difference, you know. No. It's um, so that's kind of where that discussion is at right now. So we're not 100% committed to the second vehicle yet. But it's been a problem. No. Needless to say. No. All right. So keep that on the the radar then. Yeah, it's yeah. it's it's a weekly if not more frequent discussion between me and Jim. All right. And then uh, have you heard from Jess at all regarding the deliberative session minutes? Um, so um, she insists that she she sent them up to DRA. Um, DRA sent us an email back saying they're still looking for my disappointment is that when she sent them out, and actually I had requested that she send them to me so I could upload them to the DRA portal so I could be sure that they were done. Mm -hmm. If she sent them to DRA, I wish she could have at least CC'd me on that so I would have had a copy of them handy so that worst case scenario, I could have attempted to look, look, upload them to the DRA portal. Um, so that's where that stands. So that's still in flux? Still in flux. Yeah. Because there's yeah, a, uh, a woman. Hopefully, by you know, one way or the other. Uh, I mean, I don't even have those deliberative session minutes are on our town mini recorder, mm -hmm. right? That's that the deliberative session uh, was recorded on that. Uh, Ron unfortunately had some technical difficulties with the video that night, so we don't. We only have a third of the meeting uh, recorded on video, so that tape recorder is critical. And honestly, if Jess would return the recorder, I can have somebody else transcribe the minutes and, and upload them if I have to. I mean, if it gets to that point. Well, even that email that she had sent before should be able to be forwarded to you or resent again. Uh, potentially, actually, I can have Debbie do that because I think Debbie, we had Greg uh, forward uh, Jessica's email. Uh, yeah, cause, yeah, to, to if it's in her sent, yeah, if it's in her sent file. Because so, she said that she sent it to a lady named Penny. I spoke right, to her. Penny. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this is all like things that like it could be fixed pretty it, easily with like an email correspondence. You just or, need some cooperation. Uh, or even like you said, Debbie has access right. to it. So just yep. going in and looking for that email to Penny. Right. It should be there. Right. But if they're not, are you saying that Jessica has the recorder in her possession? Correct. Or not? However, we can have that arranged to be picked up if necessary. Anything else on your list there, Sean? Yep. Um, so last night at SVAS, uh, as a part of the meeting, I guess they've had some new ten, uh, attendants come in. Um, and they've been working out pretty well and pitching in and taking on some of the weekend coverages. So they've actually they had more solid weekend coverage over the last month or so. Um, you know, 
than what they had had before. And there's also a few more um, new and returning attendants that are in the pipeline. So their staffing levels look um, hopeful going forward. So does that mean that they were below levels? Yeah, are it they, was an how issue. How are they increasing? It was an issue they, for them. Yeah, because it's kind of like people would come and go, and there's this ebb and flow of okay. staffing. And right now they're finding um, more people coming on to the service and then reaching back out previous um, attendants as well. And is uh, that focused on weekends or is that also during the week? During the week as well, yeah. Okay. Nights, I think, was their primary need. You know, like with the overnight times, whether it be on the weekends or during the days or uh, during the week. I thought they were short during the day because they didn't. Most of the attendants were working out of town. All I think they years. they have some full time staff that cover the daytime. Okay. Hours. Um, they did have one question uh, as far as an update on the MOU. They weren't like, as far as they were thinking that it was still in our hands. And we hadn't gotten back to them. No, we, we got back to them and said we weren't going to make the changes they asked for. They didn't want to generate the reports. Yeah, they didn't want to generate the reports, and there was something else that they asked to be changed. And we're like, there was, we weren't cha changing either one of them. And that was before the quarterly meeting, I think, right? Like a while ago? That was... <clears throat> uh, yes. So I just was. was wondering if you relayed that to them, like during that meeting. Yes. Yeah. Yep, I did, and um, he actually gave it to him. Told told him before that that we weren't going to. Yeah. Right. And um, when they came into the meeting we had here, the right quarterly meeting, uh, knowing what our input was on it, um, uh, Jim Hicks said they were they were reluctant um, to move forward with an MOU. That didn't incorporate the changes that they requested, and that's where it was left. Okay. And they were going to go back and look at it and talk about it, because he did. He wanted to talk to the full SVAS board. Uh, he didn't want to commit for them. Mm -hmm. And I never heard back what the outcome of that discussion was, if there was one. And if I recall, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong. Did you not? let us know that the information that they have been providing, which is what they didn't want to provide any longer, right. was available to us via the state anyhow because they had to report that information. Um, I'm, that didn't come from me. Okay. Okay. Um, I, I, that might have been Meredith that said that there's, there's another... Yeah, I believe it was that Meredith way. that said something about it. She says that, yeah, that's... I don't recall meeting with Meredith, that's why, but it doesn't, no, doesn't she, matter. Well, she was in that. But I wasn't. Yeah. That's why I understand yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. It was somebody said that, that I do remember that exact thing because I was going to say, I think it was a report that we could actually get generated. It might take us longer to get it because we'd have to request it from dispatch or whoever it is. But she says, yeah, it, it's, it's stuff that has to be reported so we could get it if we wanted yeah. to by freedom yeah. of information. Okay. So you'll chase yeah. that one down. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I just it was on the, the we didn't even touch on it last night, but it's at the bottom of the minutes. Update MOU multiple question marks, Sean, multiple question marks. So I forgot to bring it up tonight and just see as so far as we No, I didn't forget. No, we <laughs> it was a lively discussion last night, so I think it was it got to a point in the night, nine o'clock and everybody was ready to to uh, call it in. So Good. And uh, boilers. If there's any update on the boiler, like we where that was going. We met last Thursday with uh, Doug White, who's doing this from all across the town. Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to give us proposals, but he wants the information from Eversource first. He's, so that's the energy audit yeah, end of it. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Because he thinks a lot of the boilers are oversized yeah. and he's also going to give us options with uh, replacing kind or go to condensing boiler or he 
one of the things he was going to advocate is uh, pellet boilers. Mm -hmm. So once we can get him, uh, get Eversource uh, commit to come out to do an energy audit uh, and get him that information. Okay. So the situation that we have now down in building three is one of the furnaces is down. And um, one of the, you know, we're going to get quotes. In fact, I think we already have one quote back from a vendor to replace it. The, um, it seems, uh, it seems ridiculous to replace it with a new boiler when we don't have the results of the energy audit. Mm -hmm. So one of the options that, you know, Mark and Peter and I have um, discussed is there is a propane based heater in the Sally port of building two here that can be potentially moved over there that while it doesn't have all the capacity we need, right now all we're worried about is keeping the water pipes from freezing in that end of the building. So moving that over, getting a hundred gallon propane tank to sit on the outside of the building might at least get us through this winter while we're dealing with the energy audit and the other recommendations where we have a more comprehensive plan on how to move forward with all these facilities. Um, we have the, you, you already saw the proposals to replace the boiler at the fire station and those units that we were looking at we're going to improve efficiency 35 to 40 percent but again if we're going to look at a wood pellet or some other type of solution that boiler is functioning right now it's not you know cross our fingers nothing happens to it it is mm -hmm. over 50 years old um, but it is functioning and uh, could probably get us through another winter but it's um, you know interesting enough the fire station goes through more heating oil in the DPW garage, which is significantly bigger and has more furnaces. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we were hoping to make a change this year to at least <coughs> make the fire station more efficient. But if you go down there and look at that building in detail, it's not insulated. Um, you know, it's got issues. Yeah. Uh, so an energy audit and some recommendations from uh, from that, I think, would lead to a more comprehensive plan of what to do with that building as well. So, but timing is everything. You know? Now, as far as the furnace being down, Hang on. like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> building three, though, Scott, I thought uh, before we go and even incur the cost of <clears throat> relocating an existing uh, mm -hmm. propane heater, I thought we were going to see whether because that back area is serviced by two units. Yeah. One of the units is down. Doug thought, geez, this looks like it's been oversized in the first place because it was probably sized when the petition between the cold storage where the highway packs all their equipment mm -hmm. and what was the shop before that wall went up. So. We're still looking just to heat that area there, but we only have yep. one unit running. It right. may so, so the one the one unit running doesn't doesn't have enough BTUs uh, to heat that entire space. Now, can it keep it above freezing? Mm -hmm. Maybe, um, but now it's you're, not. You're all. talking about the space. Like, is that with the green center? It's the green. What I call right. the green center. Storage, storage area. Yeah, the clothes. Yeah. Well, the clothes were and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there's. Um, and from there, because they actually have a pretty big section. Yeah. 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 Well, the unit right above the doorway when you walk out of the green center into that storage into that. area, there's a unit up there. The yeah. one at the back is the one that's. Right. Gone. So the. Yeah. So, yeah. Right as you walk into that area, there's a unit right overhead mounted on the wall. That's. Yeah. That's uh, the one that's, that's about a smaller unit. Yeah, that's about 150,000 BTUs. Mm -hmm. um, the, then about two-thirds of the way, if you get, start heading out toward the garage door, about two-thirds of the way down the wall is where the, burn, you know, the other unit is that has you know, 
Yeah, no, I got, yeah. Yeah, give it up the ghost. So do we think it's prudent to do what Scott had suggested or Peter um, and move the one out of building two because it's not operational? I wouldn't like to, bother to moving put, it if we know, we don't even know whether that furnace that is working can maintain the temperature at 40 degrees in that space. But that, so it's an unknown. So, so an unknown. In, in an emergency, in an emergency, we, we can to, just like, get rent a small heater and put it where the uh, right. pipe is for the well. So, and Doug was advocating that those two furnaces now are running off of a day tank and an oil tank that's in there. Why wouldn't we pipe the whole thing for gas? And if we're going to do that, do it once. Don't bring somebody in to pipe for one thing and then everything that you've done yeah. goes away because the piping's not big enough to service if you're putting it So I first. think the concern yeah. is just having a backup like ahead of time instead of waiting until there's an issue. <clears throat> Right, and it's almost like and how we were talking about time the, the clerical have people. A building that, if it's we like were in January like and we're trying to say, okay, let's turn it on now. Mm -hmm. No, but the furnace is running; they can monitor what the temperatures are in there. Yeah, and if you're off, we go out and rent a heater. All right. So the the unit that has failed was definitely oversized. So that one, I think, is rated at 335,000 BTU. What the, all of the vendors are recommending to replace that with is something in the, you know, 220, 225,000 BTU range. Yeah. But they were taking into consideration, you know, we have that other 150,000 or 155,000 BTU unit hanging on the wall too. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where those those numbers come from. But again, the goal is just to keep the pipes from freezing uh, through the winter. Um, don't know that some of the Green Center folks are gonna be happy because it's gonna be a little chilly out there, but um, um, you know, that's kind of where we're at with building three. Yeah. Um, the, um, that's why I didn't know if it, that's why it would be better to make a plan now, knowing that we're not going to be able to replace or make any, any major improvements in that building until after the audit's done, until all the information is put together. You know, it could be months out still, and we're talking about getting through winter, and it's a building that's in use. Instead of just waiting to see if and when that one can keep up, and if the additional taxing on it makes that go as well. I don't know, like, do you want to wait till that moment? To I think that, a, I've already said decision? I want to wait, yes. Okay, yes. all right, good. I think it'd be better to make a plan for it. We have a plan. And just be ready to wait. We just said it. Okay, just all right, we'll wait. Furnace is working, the green center is open six hours a week, eight hours, whatever it may be. Mm. If they've got to be in there and it's 50 degrees, then it's 50 degrees. My concern is the well. Yeah. And you can put a light bulb there and that'll keep that going. But I don't want to be spending money that I know is just temporary. If you guys want to spend it, then, but I don't think it's a wise decision. No, sometimes you spend less when you make a like pre plan for something than yeah. you know, freaking out in the moment and like having to take whatever is available. You, you don't know the situation. Like that's gonna come up in mid Yeah, but I, I did, like I said, if all we have to do is keep a pipe from freezing, a space heater next to the pipe. And mm -hmm. that's I mean, you're talking thirty bucks at Beltates. Okay. So the plan's the way. You get the energy out of time. Alright. All the waiting and seeing doesn't and seem to be paying off so far, but yeah. Sure it is. <laughs> oh yeah? Yeah, just not seeing it. <laughs> Alright. I guess I gotta wait some more. Anything else on there? No, no, that's All it. Alright. Uh
Motion to go into non-public under RSA 91. Uh, hang on. No, it's oh, sorry. Just one item. Uh, so our, I don't know if any of you are aware that the water well at the fire department uh, had an issue yesterday. Um, so the pump failed. Um, Skillings and Son uh, came out to repair it. Uh, so we have a repair bill of a little over $2,400. Uh, to get the water running again. One of the problems they found when they were testing is there's only 208 volts of power going to the well pump. It really needs to be higher than that. Um, there was some concern that some of the other uh, devices, including the new washing machine in the uh, fire department, are rotting the well pump of energy if they're both trying to run simultaneously and obviously the wash machine and the pump would have to run at the same time. So they identified some other electrical issues down there that probably need to be addressed at some point. And um, what'd you say the voltage was at the pump? 208 is what they measured it at. That's the peak. That apparently it drops lower than that at points. But if it, they're not gonna get I'm just, okay. I'm just passing on what Skillings and Sons told us. And, uh, but the water's running, but they, they are predicting that we are going to have other issues there if we don't address some of the electrical issues in that building. So. I want to understand clearly. Are they saying that their pump doesn't operate at 208 volt? That's what they're saying. What does it operate at? Um, I'm not sure. Something higher than that is what they were looking for. Hmm. Okay. So they put in a new pump? They did. So is that all that they needed to do? Uh, no, actually, I can. Uh, I don't have it with me, but I do have a, a uh, document that I can email out to you, so that you can all see the extent of the work that they did yesterday for twenty four hundred change. In. And that probably has the notes on the voltage and stuff. So. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. Yep. Motion to go into non public under RSA 91A32A. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 